So today we have a rare, uh, unusual treat. We have the two uh, pre-court directors in a panel with uh, noted uh, Hoover Energy Task Force uh, energy expert David Federer moderating. I would say this is unusual because it's unusual for both of the uh, co-directors to be in town at the same time. Uh, same time, uh, uh, let alone be at the same in town and at the same place at exactly the same moment. So we're, uh, I personally am very uh, grateful for, for that, and I think they were anxious to talk to the uh, global energy, the uh, campus, and then global energy community basking in the glow of a very successful global energy forum back in early November, I think it was. So they're going to talk to us today with David's. Uh, uh, leader through David's uh, moderation uh, about uh, the future of energy here at Stanford and around the world. So David, take it away. So thanks everyone for coming to the uh, energy seminar. John, how long has the energy seminar been going on here at Stanford? Mm, let's see, two, six, three, 11 years, 12 years? At least. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. So, so I was, uh, I'm at the Hoover Institution. I'm a research analyst there. I work with George Schultz on energy policy issues. Um, and I've known Arun and Sally for a while now. Uh, previously, I was an undergrad here at Stanford. I studied in the Earth Systems uh, program, and that's where I got interested in energy. So, you know, when I think about energy today, um, that's where I start uh, sort of uh, 10, 12, 15 years ago at what my boss calls, uh, you know, an inflection point in energy in the U.S. in terms of technology and awareness of different issues around policy, climate, things like that. Um, and so, you know, today I'd like to talk about, with Arun and Sally, where we are on energy as a country and sort of how Stanford has played into that conversation and how it's doing that today, where we're going Next, um, just to introduce them briefly, they are co-directors of the Stanford Precourt Institute for Energy. Um, Sally uh, was formerly at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where she was deputy director of operations, came to Stanford in 2007. Um, and she's a geologist, a geohydrologist by, by training. Um, and uh, worked uh, later to direct Stanford's um, Global Climate and Energy Project, GSEP. Uh, about the time that Sally was coming to Stanford, Arun, you were also over at LBNO across the bay and a professor at Berkeley. Um, later went into government as the founding director of ARPA-E, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. Uh, under the Obama 1.0 administration, uh, working with Secretary Chu. Uh, later went to work for some of Google's energy initiatives before joining us here at Stanford as well, and you're now in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material mm -hmm. Science, is that right? Yes, right. Um, so, you know, we'll come back to, I think, both those issues, GSEP and, and RPE and, and relationship to Stanford. Um, but let me take you back you know, to my life uh, as, a, as an undergrad and the issues that I saw with energy then and under the George W. Bush administration early in the mid-2000s and to set the context for, I think, what has happened in energy since then, because I think really I've had a step change uh, in this country in the past dozen years or so, um, and the role that Stanford has played in delivering that um, to today. So wh what did we think about back then when we thought about energy? We thought about, I think, First, you know, top of mind, early 2000s, was really access to energy and a lack of energy. I mean, I think we were generally concerned that we would not have enough energy to go around. Um, we had very intelligent and honorable men and women arguing about peak oil theories, um, not just in the U.S., looking at the peak of oil production in 1970 here, but for the whole world. Um, of course, now, if you look back, that seems kind of silly when our oil production has well exceeded what we had in 1970. Um, you know, prices were through the roof. Uh, natural gas was uh, reaching 12 or $13 per MMBTU, and I think today in the US it's about $3 per MMBTU. Um, that was mostly a fossil energy story, uh, oil and gas. You know, oil and gas is about 80, 81% of the world's energy use. That's true today, that was true 10 years ago, that was true 20 years ago, that was true 30 years ago. Oil and gas has been about 80% of our total primary energy supply. Um, so that was a lot of sort of uh, what was happening uh, underneath the ground. The National Petroleum Council 
had an interesting report called Facing Hard Truths on Energy, where they argued that the US was in a very precarious place in its energy supply situation, and something needed to change, or we'd be really beholden to, to imports. Um, and then there's the issue of energy access for the developing world, um, getting the billion plus uh, people who don't have access to modern clean energy um, on the grid uh, using clean fuels. And I think of those issues of energy access, you could say sort of the price issue and the peak oil issue has been addressed, but the energy access issue really has not. There's a lot to be done there, and maybe Sally could come back to that later to get your views on that. Um, you know, the second issue I would flag is um, the idea of competitiveness, international competitiveness for the United States and energy technology. I think there was really a feeling in the mid-2000s that the US might be falling behind in our ability to produce the advanced technologies we needed to compete uh, with China, even with Europe. Um, and this extended into energy. Um, the National Academy put out a study called uh, Rising Above the Gathering Storm in 2005, uh, which reflected a lot of these concerns about the US falling behind on education and key technologies. There was some dispute over you know, how true that was, but that ultimately led to something called the America Competes Act, uh, which uh, was the founding charter for, uh, for RPE, uh, which uh, Arun later led. So uh, maybe you have some commentary on, on that history and how that plays into the university uh, ecosystem. Then there was climate. I think today we talk about energy and climate is sort of first in mind. I intentionally put it third on my list, you know, looking back 10 or 15 years because it was growing as a concern, but it wasn't uh, the number one focusing issue. Um, science was clearly progressing beyond, uh, I think, uh, the policy world's uh, acknowledgement this is going to be a key issue. Uh, it was progressing beyond general public attitudes and media. You know, it was still common. You would read a New York Times story, it would mention climate change. And it would be sort of a he said, she said. You know, scientists say this, but this guy says that, and we're not really sure what's happening. And there was more uncertainty back then. Um, but there was a feeling that this was going to become more and more central to the energy story uh, going ahead. Um, and, you know, people at Stanford played a big role in that. Folks like uh, Steve Schneider was one of my professors back then. He was really one of the early people, uh, both involved in the science of climate change and in the idea of how you can communicate that to the general public. The policymakers who really advocated for scientists, not necessarily advocating for policies, but advocating for their own research, um, as opposed to letting someone else just sort of read the paper and decide what it meant, but to actually engage. But he was very careful in how he did that. Um, I can recall I took a seminar with him, and um, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, and Steve had gone on Letterman to talk about the impact on rising seas and hurricanes, and was this all due to climate change? And he played the clip for us, and uh, you know, Letterman kind of egged him on to say, yes, this was all due to, to, to climate change, so we had these policy changes. And he came back and he said, well, you know, I feel bad about that. I went a little bit beyond what I felt I was comfortable with on the science and what it really showed, because that's what I wanted to believe. Today, you know, that science is probably stronger on that, but he felt like at the time, um, you know, he wanted to be careful to keep the credibility of the scientific community as they sort of learn and set these ground rules for how they're going to engage on the, on the policy issue. And that really started to affect energy as well. Um, just a couple other folks at Stanford. Um, Chris Field, uh, who founded uh, the Carnegie Institute's um, Center for Global Ecology, um, was uh, very influential in some of, the early, uh, some of the early IPCC work on this and in the science of understanding how, how elevated carbon dioxide affect ecosystems around the world, um, including with some, some work over at Stanford's Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve. Um, uh, uh, BP, uh, Lord Brown, when he was heading BP in the late 90s, gave a very influential speech at Stanford, where it was basically the beginning of BP's Beyond Petroleum branding and the idea they're going to have to move beyond their bread and butter, uh, oil and gas. Um, and later, uh, Lee Raymond for ExxonMobil spoke on that as well at Stanford, uh, acknowledging some of the role of uh, human activity in climate change, which uh, led to, to GCEP. And maybe Sally, you could tell us some of that history and how that relates to today. Finally, there was the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and I would say at the time, you know, that climate was not a particularly partisan issue. You know, uh, Senate had sort of voted 97-0 to say, uh, Kyoto negotiations are going on. Don't bring us back a treaty where the developing country doesn't have goals or we won't even vote on it. And ultimately, even though the US signed it, it was never even brought before the Senate because there just wasn't really enough buy-in yet and comfort with the idea 
um, in Washington, and that's something that's, that's changing today as well. Um, last, I would say, cutting over that, looking at the issues on energy in that, in that era um, was, the, was the policy question, sort of cross cuts. Um, uh, you know, from my perspective as an undergrad, I saw how economists at Stanford were really uh, early movers on, in the policy analysis world on, on energy and climate. They had a background in doing natural resource economics. Um, folks here like Larry Goulder, uh, really world experts in thinking about things like pricing emissions, carbon taxes versus cap and trade. He continues to be active in that today. I don't know if Larry's in the room now. Um, or uh, John over here with this Energy Modeling Forum group at Stanford, which for many years has brought together uh, modelers for uh, environmental and economic uh, systems to ask policy questions and to give factor analysis. Uh, California was starting to engage in a lot of uh, climate policy issues, energy policy issues, uh, the Pavley Bill, Vehicle Efficiency Standards in 2002, AB 32 in 2006. Um, folks like Jim Sweeney over here were influential in advising some of the California uh, policymakers on sort of better and worse ways to approach um, some of these early climate policies. Um, then we have folks today like um, Catherine Mock, who was, I think, a PhD student in the EIPA program when I was an undergrad here, and some of these climate issues were coming up. And in the past few years, and here at Stanford today, been extremely influential in guiding some of that policy in science. Um, going forward. So, you know, I, I go back in time to sort of give a sense to you know, some of the undergrads or grad students here, the ways uh, in which these questions have evolved and to give a sense that people at Stanford have engaged on this um, in, in a very broad way. Energy, you know, goes from physicists, you know, at Slack who are looking at molecular interactions to folks like myself at the other far end who are thinking about how policymakers uh, approach, uh, how they prioritize sort of uh, their constituencies' concerns about energy and climate issues broadly. And there are a lot of ways to engage. You know, I think people can feel um, helpless sometimes about energy and particularly climate issues. But I would uh, urge you to think of the ways that Stanford students and professors have been constructive in this space over the past 10 or 15 years and really defining a new uh, era in energy and climate technologies in the United States and how they continue to do that today. Um, so maybe I'll turn to Sally and Arun and let them talk for the rest of this session. Um, but, you know, Sally, we talked about, um, you know, GSEP and some of the, uh, the ways in which, um, you know, climate concerns were coming into the energy R&D space. Uh, how would you describe sort of that history of GSEP and then, you know, 15 years ago, the way we thought about these issues versus how we're thinking about them today at, at Stanford? Okay. Um, well, since you went back to the mid-2000s, I'm actually going to take us back a little take earlier in time. I, I think I'm going to start out in the mid-1970s, uh, which is the first time I ever got any awareness of energy. And I was living in the, the Bay Area. And this was uh, the first energy crisis where conflict in the Middle East uh, led to a sh severe shortage of, of uh, petroleum. Uh, in the United States, and it was really, really bad. If you wanted gasoline, you had to get it only every other day, and, and the lines to get gasoline was was huge. And, and back then, everyone was driving cars that maybe got eight miles to the gallon or 10 miles to the gallon. I mean, really, really incredible. And uh, <clears throat> so that was a really wake-up call to everybody that, that there was something fundamentally wrong, and the price of oil shot up, I think, like three times. And that's a huge shock when you think about the fact that usually energy takes about 10% of the economy. And if you take something that's that important and all of a sudden you bump that up triple, you know, all of a sudden you can set off a, a, a recession. So uh, in response to that, um, the, the government decided to make a big push uh, in the investment in a couple of things. One was in the area of renewable energy. And the other one was to try to make the United States more self-sufficient in oil and gas resources. So I'll say a little bit about Stanford at that time. Uh, Stanford had then and still has today uh, a world-class petroleum engineering department. Uh, and it was called Petroleum Engineering then. And some of the most famous names uh, were busy working, trying to make so you could get more oil out of the ground 
by things like in situ combustion or steam flooding, and, and really the epicenter, a lot of, of that of innovation was here at Stanford. Um, but at the same time, it was recognized, well, we could use renewable resources. And so really um, influential people like Dick Swanson, who then went on to, uh, to make sun power, had started to work on, on, on solar energy. And people like Roland Horn, uh, one of the world's leaders in geothermal energy, was also here at Stanford uh, in, the, in the 1970s and, and began a conference uh, in a geothermal conference that still goes on to this day. So, uh, so, so that was really a huge push, you know, emphasis on increased, uh, reliant, increased reliability of hydrocarbons and renewables, diversify your supplies. And Stanford was a major player in both of those. And at the same time, energy efficiency, the importance of that, especially in California, uh, became paramount. And so people like Jim Sweeney, uh, became very heavily involved with the state and as it, you know, we heard about, started to really make it so that California became the first state to decouple its energy emissions, I mean, or, or its energy use with economic growth. Okay, and that was, that was really seminal work. So, uh, so all that went on, um, but then all of a sudden the price of oil went down and all of a sudden everybody stopped paying any attention to things like reliability of oil supplies, and oh, by the way, renewables are way too expensive, you know, and they were really expensive. You know, solar might have been you know, $100 a watt back then. So, uh, so a lot of that work kind of went into hiatus, and, and, and Stanford and many other universities uh, around the United States uh, basically slowly, I guess, divested perhaps from having such a strong focus on, on energy research. But then fast forward, uh, we, we find ourselves in, again, of rapidly rising oil prices. Uh, the US now in even a greater uh, situation with regard to shortages of, of its own domestic oil supply. And at the same time, as you heard, climate started to become a real issue. And it's like, wow, how are we going to provide all the energy we need? How do we address the climate problem? And, and how do we do that in a secure and affordable way? So that's when GSEP, uh, the Global Climate and Energy Project, uh, came along. And uh, uh, Professor uh, Lynn Orr, who was then the dean of the School of Earth Energy and Environment, well, what was then School of Earth Sciences, uh, got together with faculty from across the campus and they said, we think we really need to do something to jumpstart this next wave of, of energy innovation. You know, we need decarbonized energy products and we need reliable supplies. So, uh, so very fortuitously in, in 2002, uh, through a lot of hard work of many people, they were able to uh, partner with four companies, so very interesting. It was ExxonMobil, General Electric, Toyota, and Schlumberger came together really to do a moonshot for the future of energy. And the idea was to invest in high risk, high reward technologies that would put us on this pathway to sustainable energy for everybody. And what was so extraordinary at the time is it was a $225 million investment over a, a 10 year period. So it really definitely fit the moonshot idea. There was no university elsewhere who had anything close to the program of that magnitude. So, uh, so Chris Edwards from the Mechanical Engineering Department and Lynn Orr um, set about building that program beginning in 2002. Uh, a number of projects uh, got started and I came here in 2007 to, to help run that program. But what we were seeing is a huge amount of innovation in material science, chemical engineering, uh, advanced combustion, entirely new ideas like capturing the carbon dioxide and pumping it underground, all of that got going in that time period. And it really spurred this tremendous wave of innovation across the School of Engineering, 
and the School of what's now Earth Energy and Environmental Sciences. And Stanford did this really long before most other universities were really starting to pay attention. And so it was really with sort of the incredible leadership of uh, the folks here that began to make that happen. So, so that gets us up to around 2007 or so. Yeah. Um, Arun, do we have all the technologies we need now in uh, energy and, and climate? Uh, tell, us, tell us a little bit about the handoff between university research of the sort that Sally has described what you're doing at RPE and how that interfaces um, today with an industry involvement as well. You know, to be honest, first of all, Happy New Year to everyone. <laughs> um, I wish there were all the technologies that we needed to um, maintain our temperatures below two degrees Celsius, which is what the uh, United Nations has said. Um, and I'm afraid I don't think we have that. So what was the mandate for RPE? Let me actually take you back even further. Because, and this goes back to the origins of DARPA. DARPA was created in 1958 in response to the 1957 launch of Sputnik. And at which time it was thought that this was an existential threat for the United States. And DARPA got created not because we did not have research already going on under the Office of Naval Research in the Navy, in the Air Force, in the Army, et cetera, it was all going on, but they needed a new model of research. And, and that was to blur the boundaries between science and engineering, um, to go uh, basic as you needed to, to go applied if you needed to, just forget these terms for the time being, and look for breakthroughs that would you know, create a competitive advantage. That was the whole idea. And the model was that to get the smartest people who are actually doing the research in the scientific community in the government and give them ownership of creating new fields of research. But to be time limited so you, after a while you get out of there. You cannot stay there as a permanent staff. And so that brought in a freshness of ideas from different people to come in and create new fields. And many careers got built by starting new fields and creating a ecosystem, a community of researchers in that particular field, which is how you know, things like you know, the internet, the TCP IP. Uh, in fact, um, uh, Vince Cerf was a faculty out here. And he left Stanford, went to DARPA. And in fact, the first TCP IP implementation happened out here at Stanford. And, and, and a few other places. So that's the kind of thing that with, uh, the DARPA created. And it was felt, as you mentioned, um, in the Gathering Storm report, that the energy field needed that because there was some uh, gathering storms in that. Not only because of the fact of, as you said, access to energy, because access to energy is a national security issue, but the fact that there's been going on the traditional ways of energy was going on for a while, and they saw there's some barriers coming in, whether it's access or whether it is uh, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. The fundamentals were changing. And so they felt that there's a, despite the fact that the Department of Energy has a lot of research going on in fundamental science, as well as in some of the applied, there was a gap that was felt. And that's why the idea of RPE was created, to look for breakthroughs in energy technologies. And I think one has to take a long-term view on this. Sometimes, you know, RPE is thought of as a short-term thing. They say, hey, let's commercialize. I would take a long-term view and take back even further to how we got into this. We got into this in a climate issue starting from the Industrial Revolution. And the Industrial Revolution, the steam engine started, what, 1776? That was the Watt, James Watt engine. Before that, it was a new common engine, okay? And James Watt, increase the efficiency from, I think, 0.0 or 0.1 to 1%, okay? And it turns, and we all know now that the, it follows the laws of thermodynamics. Well, the laws of thermodynamics were developed, were finally put into, in 1850s. So this was fundamental science that came after engineering. And so the idea that science gives you engineering, engineering gives you technology, that was broken 
in the 1700s and 1800s. And I think if you take that long-term view and ask the question, what are the new things that we need today? And I suspect that the technologies that we will be engaged in, with, we developing, will lead to new science that we don't understand today. And I think that's the long-term view on this, and that's part of the reasons RPE was created, not only to develop new technologies, breakthroughs, but also blur the boundaries between science and engineering, and let's solve the problem. And in solving the problem, we will come up with new scientific principles that we don't know today. And so that was how RPE got started. And through that process, you know, whether it is part of the, as you said, America Competes Act, there's a global competitiveness in this that, that we'll have to address at some point. And that's part of why it was in, in the Competitive uh, Competes Act. Uh, you mentioned some uh, fundamental science changes. Can you give us some, some crumbs, areas where you think that um, we'll make major discoveries? We don't know well, for example, we don't completely understand the science of photosynthesis. Okay? <laughs> we survive on it. We don't quite understand that, right? We haven't been able to understand fully or exploit fully how fusion works. Um, and fusion in the sense of controlled fusion. Um, and we st it is still a science problem. And we don't completely understand all the details of that. And that is a work. And there are many such examples that you could give where the principles has still have to be developed. And things that we can't anticipate right now because we haven't quite developed the things. Yeah, so, so I'll give you, I think, another example that is not quite so far out as fusion. So if you look at material science, and if you look back to, uh, gosh, it must have been the, in the, around the 2000 time frame, that there was a real revolution in material science that we realized that the that the materials behave differently in bulk than they do when you make them into very small like nanoparticles. So, so we opened up this incredible toolkit of new functionality of materials. So, so that's one thing we did. At the same time, there was a revolution in uh, the ability to characterize materials using synchrotron radiation, that you could uh, look at the species of the chemical, you could understand the structure and function of those materials. So that was a really important piece. The other thing is, is that we ha began to have advanced computing that allowed us to calculate the function of the, how these materials would function from an atomic level using very advanced theoretical tools. And so the taken together, those three things, uh, and the ability to synthesize all these new materials has created really a revolution. And you know, we now have uh, technologies that can take carbon dioxide and water uh, and a renewable source of electricity, and they can make a fuel. Now, maybe it's still a little bit too expensive, and maybe it's not as efficient as like we'd like, but we can do that. Uh, we can make advanced battery chemistries with these same ideas. We can make uh, solar cells, thin film solar cells, with these same kind of ideas. So there's been this huge revolution that, you know, much like the, the human genome, you know, the, that got going with the hope that there were going to be all these medical breakthroughs with that. And it actually took a really long time before those medical breakthroughs started to occur in, with genomics, but they have. And those same kind of uh, fruition for bringing this new fundamental science uh, to solving energy problems is here today. I mean, you, you talk about distinct technologies sort of coalescing together into mm -hmm. some kind of a breakthrough product. Uh, there's a story of uh, Apple and the invention of the iPod. And um, distinct technologies are floating out there. You had um, small screens that were, you could manufacture uh, for low cost in Asia. Um, didn't really know what they were going to do with it. Then you had um, you know, digital music, you know, MP3s. People were downloading them or sharing them online. There were a few stores you could buy them from. There were some early MP3 players, but you didn't have a good distribution system. And so uh, there's a story of Phil Schiller coming to Steve Jobs and saying, look, we have these things. And now we have this new thing, which is a 1.8 inch miniaturized hard drive. Mm -hmm. And if you put these three things together, now suddenly you by themselves are not that useful. You put the three together and you get a really breakthrough product that you didn't even realize was possible before. I mean, in, in that way, if you look back on GSEP, for example, and the hundreds of, of projects that really were, mm -hmm. were examined over 10 years, 
Are there any big surprises in your mind, things that came up from that that you weren't expecting, or things that didn't work out that you thought might work out? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think we always had huge hope that good things were going to happen from this investment. I, I guess what's encouraging that we've seen is that initially, um, not to sound judgmental, but the, the approach was very sort of Edisonian. You know, there was a lot of trying and seeing. It's like, okay, we can make this, let's see how it works. What I think is really surprising is how all of those pieces have now come together to make discovery and effectiveness much more deliberate. So I think it's a really encouraging result. And I think we're really at just the beginning of being able to design materials that do many things that we would like and need them to do. Uh, Arun, we talked a little bit about the innovation chain. Mm -hmm. Could you describe some of the handoffs between work that goes on at, say, the university or national lab, and then um, how energy innovation gets out into industry? What does that relationship look like? Yeah, so at if, if, you, if you really look at, if you want to make impact in energy um, at a large scale, scale is important, and cost is important, right? That's at the macro level. Um, you got to have large scale, otherwise you're not going to make impact. And if it's not economically competitive, okay, it's not going to make impact. So both are important, but if you, if, you narrow, if you now take one step deeper as to how to get that, you need R&D to be able to get to scale as well as reduce the cost. And so one of the challenges that we have today, um, going from a university research, which is the laboratory research, which by definition is not at scale, okay, to an industrial scale is that there are lots of layers in between. And so we need the, I would say, handoff, sure, but really feedback loops um, where we at the university understand what the major challenges are from, um, from the industry. By definition, things at that scale are not through university, are through the industry. So the industry has to educate us as to what the challenges are mm. And, and frankly, where they are unwilling to go, where the universities can go because of a risk appetite, because we have a long -term, longer term view than sometimes the industry. And so that feedback loop is very important. And for them to take the things that we do at a university and then transition that at different levels of scaling. I mean, you've got to have, you know, in a lab, we have a proof of concept. Um, some way you need to develop a proof of system, which sometimes we do at a university, but sometimes it has to go outside. It has to have a pilot operation at some point. And as you go downstream like this, you will need more capital. And not quite at a university, that we can't do that. Can you give an example where uh, industry has come to you as a researcher at a university or elsewhere and said, you know, here's the problem that we're dealing with and we well, can't figure it out? Tons of examples. Yeah. GCEP is a great example of that. And, and now we are seeing sort of the, the next stage of GCEP is what we call Strategic Energy Alliance. We're working with the corporations, large corporations, looking at issues that they cannot by themselves do, you know, whether it's carbon capture sequestration or whether it is renewables integration onto the grid. Um, they by themselves cannot do. And they're coming to us to figure out what are the options we have, what are the new ideas that we could, we could try out and some of them will fail by definition because these are risky proposition. But the ones that succeed will actually then change the ball game in the future. And so in a many times we look at energy technologies as following what is called a learning curve. You know, the more you do, the cheaper it gets. You know, the more solar panels we generate, we get better at it and it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. The, one of the roles of the university is not only to enable that to happen, but also to look for ways to, be, to create entirely new learning curves that we don't have today that have the shot at becoming cheaper and better and faster and cleaner than what we have today. The lithium ion battery, for example, made nickel metal hydride batteries obsolete. Okay? And the question we should be asking is, what are the battery technologies that we should be looking at, or storage in general, that could make the lithium ion batteries obsolete. And that's the role of university now. Industry that is invested in lithium ion batteries is unlikely to do that. Right, yeah. Might. 
Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I, but I do have a, one more surprise that right. I think. Has... Stanford, uh, you know, has a, a great, I think, history of working with industry in a constructive way. Um, you know, MIT does that as well. My boss, George Schultz, likes to say, oh, Silicon Valley is just a Stanford spinoff. Um, but I, you know, I think that that's, uh, <laughs> I, 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 it, it, allow, is, it allows you know, the work that students do here, I think, to have uh, to broader impact and to really see like, what, how what they do in the lab translates uh, beyond that. Sally, did you have a point? Yeah, I, I just want to go back to some uh, surprise. Um, and maybe it's more of a lesson learned. One of the things that we did as part of the Global Climate and Energy Project is to do systems, energy systems analysis that would help us make good investments in those technologies that were likely to have a big benefit. And we began studying things like batteries and in particular got very interested in how much energy it actually takes to build a battery. And so that it turns out that if you choose to use a battery and, for example, pair that with a solar cell, that sort of your first reaction would be, well, of course it would always be better to have a battery because when I'm not using the sunlight directly, I can then save it and use it till later. But it turns out for even simple systems where you pair a battery and a solar cell, um, in many cases, because of the systems effect, you don't get all the benefits, the environmental benefits that you think you're getting. And just to give another example, that if we right now, you know, solar energy, wind energy um, are really, really inexpensive. Actually, natural gas is really inexpensive right now. And so, because, well, especially because solar and wind are so inexpensive, people say, well, oh my gosh, well, that's our solution to the climate problem will be to just double down on those, just use the most of all the cheap stuff you can get. But the problem is, is we rely on 24-7 power, 365 days a year. So when you try to say, okay, we're going to limit our choices to say two, two or three choices or those plus a battery, that you end up having to overbuild the system so much so that what you think is going to be the cheapest solution because they're all the cheapest component in fact may not be the cheapest solution and some recent work we're doing in california has actually shown that it's cheaper if you say okay well let's have a little bit of carbon capture and storage for our electricity system and the overall cost of getting to 100% decarbonization is about one third the cost that would it be if you only said we're going to have batteries, mm -hmm. solar, and wind, and hydro. So, so the systems aspects are really important. And I think we're just beginning to come to grips with that. And this is a topic, I don't know if you saw uh, Bill Gates' year-end letter this year. He, he touches on this, this mm -hmm. need for, for new technologies as well. You know, to that end, uh, just before the Christmas holiday, uh, Arun and Sally, you co-authored uh, an op-ed in the Financial Times. With George. Uh, with Secretary, Secretary Schultz. Schultz uh, uh, talking about um, th the need for the massive investment uh, in energy uh, R&D to deal with uh, today's energy and climate challenges. Uh, you mentioned the uh, Global Energy Forum, um, which took on this issue, and, and Bill Gates spoke at that um, a couple months ago here at Stanford. Can you give us a little rundown about what the Global Energy Forum is, um, why we're hosting it at Stanford, and, and where that's headed? <laughs> <laughs> we are speechless. Co-directors. Co we're speechless. Never. Well, I, I think it's, first of all, if you look at the role of Stanford, we certainly, we know that the, some of the research that's, um, we are amongst the best in terms of the research that is produced out here. Um, the scientific research, the technologies that come out, the policy work that is done, et cetera. <laughs> but I think Stanford has, a, in many ways, a unique role to bring together an ecosystem that needs to be brought together to accelerate this progress. I mean, I, one of the things that, one of the key takeaways from the Global Energy Forum is the fact that we don't have much time. If you are to keep below two degrees Celsius, we can emit only about 800 gigatons of carbon. And, and if you look at the emission rate today, which is about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year, 800 gigatons of CO2 uh, as, the, as the budget. And if you're emitting at 40 gigatons of CO2 per year, 
we have roughly 20 years at flat rate. And then after that, it has to be zero. This conversation is going to be great in 20 years, by the way. This, that's <laughs> right. So we don't have much time left on our hands. And if you are to keep it below 2 degrees, otherwise it's going to go beyond. So given all, in a, and there's a lot of feeling that, in a, there's a lot of sense that all this innovation that's going on in wind, you know, wind and solar and natural gas and all, terrific. It is terrific. And there's a lot of R&D that has gone into it. But that's necessary and certainly not sufficient. And I think it is very important to bring this ecosystem together, as you said, along this innovation value chain, to bring them together to accelerate that, to create this feedback loop. And I think Stanford has a role to play, and frankly, others also have a role to play as well. So we decided at Stanford that, A, to not only showcase what's going on out here, but also play that role of a convener. Uh, there are you know, the very few conveners, neutral conveners, that can bring the community together. The government can certainly do that. Right now, it's not quite happening. They want to. Right, right. <laughs> so I think we should take the responsibility and play that role of bring the community together so we can start accelerating this thing. And this is a global conversation. This is not just the United States conversation, because as Bill very correctly pointed out, if China and India doesn't get it right, we're toast in terms of two degrees. So it's that global community that we need to build. And this is, and frankly, we have, GCEP has provided, and the, all the previous work has provided a tremendous platform. We need to take it another level. Um, Sally, what, what should undergrads at Stanford uh, know about how they can be involved on, on energy issues, whether they're on the hard engineering side or mm -hmm. sort of soft policy folks like myself? Yeah, well, I think number one is if you're interested in energy, it doesn't matter what discipline you want to study there's something that you can study. If you want to be a lawyer, you can work on energy. If you want to be in business, if you want to be uh, an engineer, an earth scientist, that there's really something for everybody, uh, the humanities, you know, economics. Mm -hmm. So I think that's number one. So if you think you're interested, don't think that you have to be an engineer. So, so second thing is, is that we offer a ton of programs here at Stanford for our, our undergraduates. Uh, the first thing you can do is take a fantastic class called Understanding Energy. Uh, after that, we have a fantastic sophomore college where you a, a deep three-week immersion in, uh, in ge geography-specific energy issues, undergraduate research programs, uh, internships with, with government. Um, anyway, it just goes on and on. So, so find your way to get involved in that ecosystem. Um, we do everything we can to help. Uh, write us an email if, uh, if you can't figure out how to do it, and, uh, yeah, and, uh, and just jump right in. Thanks. Um, John, Katie, do we have a couple of minutes for questions from the audience? Why don't you uh, just take questions from the audience for a little bit, maybe 10 minutes or so, probably not. Sure. Uh, any, any students? Um, who want to know how to engage on energy at Stanford? Students? Yeah. I think over there. Uh, I was wondering if there are any thoughts or research you can develop that in China, the Indonesian degree development, and just the future in China? Fusion in China. Are you talking about some fusion? Yeah, I haven't oh, quite I followed the exactly what has happened out yeah. there. Have they, have they shown gain greater than one? <clears throat> Okay. No thoughts, no comments, because I haven't read up on what they've actually done. You know, I would just you know, chime in a little bit. You know, one um, interesting development in that space is um, we spent some time looking at uh, nuclear energy um, you know, fission uh, at the Hoover Institution. And there is a lot of uh, new entrepreneurship happening in this country with small startups. There are a few in the Bay Area looking at uh, SMRs or more advanced uh, nuclear chemistries. And uh, for the last few years, there's been this idea. Uh, Gates has been among them uh, saying that it's ha quite hard to do testing for some of these new nuclear technologies for the, given the strict regulatory framework in the US. And so maybe we'll go abroad to do this testing. We'll do it in China. He had a group, TerraPower, Terra Power, with a traveling wave reactor that they were going to build a prototype right. for in China. Um, but with some rising uh, trade tensions and concerns on IP, actually uh, this October, 
I think uh, DOE said we're actually going to control the export of civilian nuclear technologies and limit cooperation with China on these issues. And Terra Power said that's it, so we can't work in China anymore. Maybe we can work in the U.S., maybe not. You know, I'm sure that DOE would happy for them to do it in the U.S. If, they, you know, if DOE could provide some funding to do it. But I think it gives a sense, you know, Arun talked about sort of a global community um, in dealing with some of these issues. They need to be able to scale across uh, the world colliding with some of the more short-term geopolitical issues that come up and have always come up in energy. Any other questions? Student yeah. <laughs> Any yeah, discussion and I, I pose to the panel, you know, can that be done in a smooth way or is it going to be ugly? I mean, I, I think it can be done in a really disruptive way. Um, I, I think that honestly, uh, that there's a lot of, of that afoot. I think that there are some people who basically believe the only way we can solve any of these problems is, is with disruption. Uh, right now, our electric utility industry is, is uh, really being weakened by, uh, by a whole set of policies, uh, market structures, and so forth that disadvantage um, uh, the kind of traditional generating resource uh, assets. Uh, on the other hand, one can uh, strategically and deliberately uh, choose a path of investment that is designed to minimize disruption. Uh, I think no matter what, there will be some disruption, but I, I think it's really, it's really incumbent upon all of us who are interested in the security of our energy supply to, to understand, learn, educate ourselves, and, and, and advocate for pathways that, uh, that keep our energy system very, very strong. Because I've spent a lot of time in uh, emerging economies with very weak energy systems, and, uh, and that's not a, a good way to live. Yes, one of the... Yeah, to follow up on that, I'd like to ask, uh, between developing countries and developed countries, this issue of uh, clean energy, could there be different solutions not in terms of approach? Because I think, um, by the fact that there is disparity between the two, would be a way of solving that problem be different? Right. Well, let me just say that I think we should not be putting the burden on climate change on those countries that don't have access to energy. I think that's a big mistake. At the end of the day, people need energy for their own prosperity, economic development, etc. And the and the top 20 economies, I mean, I know that Paris Agreement required, what, 190 countries, 170 countries to come together to come with Paris Agreement to reduce the emissions to keep below two degrees. Uh, you really, for mitigation purposes, you do not need 170 countries to do that. You need the top 20 countries to reduce the emissions, and it's really their responsibility to do that. For the adaptation to climate change, you do need the 190 countries because they will have to adapt to 100. To, to the climate change. For those countries that are, that are undeveloped, electrification, for example, is a big deal. Today, we seem to have the tools with solar being cheap, with storage reducing in cost, and some microgrid solutions that are coming in, that te technologically this may actually be possible. But there are other barriers in terms of governance, in terms of pricing, in terms of the policy, there's financing, trying to get to microfinance and connect the microfinance, distributed finance, to the financial system that we have today, which is macro, is non-trivial. We have a sustainable finance initiative here at Stanford to be able to enable that. But those are the kinds of issues that we should be caring about as far as developing economies, developing countries are concerned. Yeah, just to say a little bit more about that, I mean, one of the things we see is a lot of um, uh, investment or in coal, uh, the, and the reason people do that is it's often uh, 
in and of itself, it has the appearances of being the cheapest uh, form, of, form of energy. But if you, for example, uh, combine solar energy and wind energy with natural gas, that can actually be as cheap or cheaper than coal. But you have to look at it as a system. Right. And it becomes more complex. And you need a better grid in order to manage that. Uh, but it can also position a country to have a much stronger, robust system in the future than making a big bet uh, on coal as a primary source of electricity. Uh, uh, just to add to that, I think in many ways, those countries that do not have the infrastructure today have the opportunity to leapfrog and to get to the 21st century grid so they can go from 19th century to 21st century. And I think that's how we should be thinking about it. Right here in the front. Uh, my question is, why is Yeah, I'd say I think that's a story that doesn't always get told, but it very much happens, you know, especially when you have industry that is, you know, making a lot of revenue in a certain field, they can then actually have a very high rate of technological development, you know, in the field and they're iterating very quickly. That's what we saw with natural gas fracking. We see that with enhanced oil recovery. Sally, I don't know if you have comments on that, but the efficiency of what has happened in terms of the ability to extract and the cost at which we can do so is is you know, a pretty amazing story if you're looking at providing energy services around the world, uh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, certainly the industry uh, invested a huge amount in hydraulic fracturing technology, which has made us you know, have abundant natural gas supplies, abundant oil supplies. So, so there is actually a lot of investment. But, but to speak more directly, um, in the short run, it's very beneficial to have much more efficient processes that use fossil fuel. Because as Arun said, we have 800 tons or 800 gigatons of CO2 that we can emit into the atmosphere before we're guaranteed to go over uh, two degrees C warming. Uh, but, we all, but we'll burn through that in about 20 years. So in the not too distant future, when you are maybe 45 or 50 years old, we're going to be in a situation where global warming will have been exceeding uh, internationally uh, agreed to targets. And, and I think we're going to find that the, a world with two degrees C warming is not a very comfortable world to be living in, particularly with regard to extreme, uh, extreme weather. Can I just add one point to this? Yeah, we'll end with this? I think you know this one degree, two degrees, you know, we are like 1.2 degrees above. The global average temperature is 1.2 degrees above that, that what we had before the Industrial Revolution. And that's absolutely accurate. And we are trying to keep it below two degrees. However, I think it is, a, as far as communicating issues related to climate and energy, it is a mistake to talk about the average. Because around this average, there's a distribution. And the tail of the distribution has a disproportionate effect on our lives, whether it is our agriculture, whether it's their livestock, uh, whether it's hurricanes and, and, or for that matter, fires. So I think it's very important that when we speak to a general public, um, that we talk about not only the average, but the tail of the distribution. And we have to say that if the tail of the one degree distribution is this bad, you can just imagine what the tail, that that tail of the two degrees is going to wag the dog. And I think it's very important to make sure that we all, not just here at Stanford, but the general public understands that. With that benediction from Reverend Majumdar, I think we'll close it out. <laughs> we'll be around if uh, anyone wants to talk to us some more. I know we've boiled the ocean here today. Well, I think we need to wrap up, so let's thank uh, Sally and Reverend